I want to bring on an old friend of ours, Rob Aho, who is the uh, partner at Braybender Cox. Um, he uh, uh, is, you know, he, he's, his panel will be engaging this issue of is TV still TV as we know it? How does a campaign, what does a campaign TV plan look like now? Or what should it look like under the extreme fragmentation across linear cable, OTT, YouTube, social, and unpaid video channels? Uh, Rob is the uh, partner at Braybender Cox. He's an old friend of ours. He's made he Rob. I think you've probably been to almost as many marketing politics shows of, as I have. You you you. I think get the ribbon. <laughs> I yeah. I I think I'm a close second place. That's for sure. Right. And he has also been to some of our summits, by the way, as well. But at Braybender, he has advised a whole host of, of, of campaigns, almost all the entire alphabet soup of Republican uh, committees, as well as Senators Young, Lankford, and Coburn, among many others. Rob, welcome back. And I'm going to just turn it over to you to start with the panel. Very good. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, really pumped about having uh, Michael from the D-Trip here, Edith from RSLC, and Erica from GMMB. So thanks guys for, for joining the panel. Um, I'd like to just start us off kind of big picture. Um, you just you just heard Rebecca and kind of the conversation that she was having about, you know, where media planning is, the different options and things like that. But I'm tempted to just ask the question, where do we feel like we are from a digital versus linear argument standpoint? Um, Edith, I'm going to kick that to you. Uh, hopefully you'll get unmuted here in a second, but um, I think that'd probably be a good place to start the conversation. And I'm guessing Michael as a digital expert might, might have some, uh, some different perspectives. Thanks so much, Robert. Uh, can you hear me? Just to make sure. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Um, um, so I, I, I'm going to start the answer to this question uh, uh, is for football. Uh, don't do a whole lot of TV watching except for during Christmas time where we watch the Hallmark Channel. Uh, so we are pretty much checking off every single kind of stereotype box you can imagine. Um, but the, the reason I kind of say all of this is because for us, most of our, our viewers from online streaming. Um, so your Hulus, your Netflix, your Amazon Primes. So for me, you know, when I started kind of taking a look at television and television purchasing and so on and so forth, you know, I was kind of like, well, why are we even doing this, right? I was kind of more in line with probably what, what a couple of folks nowadays um, tend to think. But when I started looking at the data, you know, the, the fact of the matter is we tend to live in our little silos and we just assume that everyone has to think like us. And if everyone thinks like us, then everyone acts like talking about more rural places where internet connectivity isn't necessarily where it is in kind of your more major um, DMAs, followed by, quite frankly, you're, you're still talking about people that are, you know, not necessarily, you know, watching their HBOs and stars and all that good stuff. They're still sticking with their CBSs, their NBCs, your ABCs. So, you know, the that's a long answer to essentially say, hey, I think all, all, all forms are still very valid with digital Okay. Okay. And Michael, what about for you? Um, do you kind of bring a, a little bit of a different perspective? I know you sit mostly in the digital world, but where do you see that argument of the, you know, the push pull that's existed for a couple cycles here between television and digital? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, obviously as a digital person, like I, I think campaigns should be spending more on, on digital platforms. There's no, no doubt about that. Um, but you know, the, the fun part about working in, in congressional races is, it it's hard to paint these broad brush strokes that like all campaigns should be doing X or all campaigns should be doing Y. Um, you know, like there's no question that the media landscape is changing. More people are, are switching to, you know, are cutting the cord and switching from, you know, linear TV to OTT, CTV, YouTube, um, those more digital centric platforms. Um, 
but you know, it, it for the work that we do, it really just depends on the district. Some districts, TV is going to make a whole lot of sense. And you're going to have digital, um, you know, at, at lower levels and, and some districts, digital is going to make a lot of sense. And, you know, I think for for most districts, it's going to sit somewhere in between um, where you're going to have certain audiences that are going to be better reached on on digital platforms, certain geographic areas where they're maybe in a, a, a cheaper or sorry, a more expensive media market where like digital is going to make a lot more sense um, to target those folks. Um, so, you know, I think maybe I'm a bad digital person in saying this, but like there's there's a there's a place for both in the landscape. Um, but certainly like as people are changing that as people's media habits are changing, like certainly campaigns are going to have to adapt and, and spend a lot more on on these connected platforms. Well it's a good thing we got you on the record on that. So Eric <laughs> Erica, I know GMMB does both. Does the conversation happen differently inside your shop and with your campaigns maybe than it used to a couple cycles ago or even last cycle? So for us, we we truly don't see it as a fight. Um, you know, I think Rebecca said this in her previous one. We really start from the audience first because we see them as both really powerful means of communication and we view them as working better together. So when we work in, inside the shop, like we're working hand in hand with our TV team to understand our audience consumption patterns and understand where they're spending time. Because as an audience member, you don't know if what you're watching is a streaming, um, if it's considered streaming or if it's considered digital or, you know, you you don't care. And so I think for us as marketers, we have to keep that in mind and it shouldn't necessarily be, oh, it's TV versus digital. It's where are they spending their time? Where are they consuming this media? And so we really have taken the approach of working really closely with our TV team and utilizing the data that both teams have to build out a more robust plan. How do you, I'm, I'm curious, um, how do you value, and maybe this is a question for anybody, but Eric, I'll, I'll kick this to you first. How do you place a value on the differences between screens? Obviously, you know, some are big, some are small, um, you know, in the streaming opportunities that, that we've been talking about, but how do you go about making those decisions and kind of articulating that to a, a campaign or a client so that they can kind of, you know, be a part of the decision process? Yeah, so for us, um, again, it's, it's thinking through like, if you're watching like a connected TV or OTT on a TV device, um, you know, that's a really powerful medium. If you are watching something on your iPad, that's also a powerful medium of streaming, it's forced view. And so it's really talking about the inventory and what that inventory is and less so about the device, because even if you're watching it say on your phone, but that's the only thing you're watching, that can still be a very powerful medium. Yeah, good point. Um, I want to go back for a second. I, I'm just kind of curious to hear some more stories. E Edith, maybe I'll kick this to you first, but um, please, anybody chime in. Go back to the early days of the pandemic. I know in my shop, we had um, we had multiple uh, clients up on the air, just getting ready to go up on the air. And not only did the world change, but I'm sure media plans changed. So I'm just kind of curious you know, what was it like in those early days and how did the change in viewing that happened in the weeks and months thereafter, how did that change kind of your thinking for the rest of the cycle? Okay, sorry, I'm having some technical issues. Um, honestly, one of the biggest surprises to me was how quickly everyone adapted and not just the political world, but the, the kind of um, private world as well, which is to say, you know, by the end of that first week, so, you know, it was Monday that we all kind of started our two week quarantine. Um, by the end of that week, I mean, every major brand had some type of COVID commercial on air, um, which to me was incredibly fascinating how quickly you were able to turn that around. But it kind of made me realize like, okay, you have corporate America making this shift. I think kind of political America needs to start thinking about what does that shift like look like? look like for us. Um, and I think, you know, we capitalized as much as possible. And we talk about this a lot at the RSLC, which is, you know, 
something like 76% of campaigns who started before their counterpart um, ended up being successful on election day. So there, there is a correlation with kind of being up before your counterpart. Um, and during that time where rates are relatively low across the board, it was how do we kind of really encourage our folks to get out there, whether it's with, you know, if you're an elected official, kind of that COVID specific message of, hey, this is what your government is doing for you. This is what we're doing for you as electeds. Um, but if you were running for office, then also showing kind of like, hey, how are you engaging your community or doing X, Y, and Z? And a lot of that, you know, wasn't necessarily done through through regular kind of television broadcast linear, but on the digital end of things. But the kind of most important thing was to take advantage of the fact that everybody was home. Everyone was on right. their phones, on their tablets, watching TV, because you didn't really have much else to do. Um, but finding sensitive and creative ways to do that the exact same way that corporate America, you know, by the end of the week was telling you what they were doing to make your life easier and better during these difficult times kind of thing. Michael, you were at the D trip last cycle. What was, you know, what were the media plans doing? I mean, you know, we're not looking for anything proprietary, but what was happening, you know, with your campaigns in those in those early days of the pandemic? What changed instantly on you guys? Yeah, I mean, in the earliest days of the pandemic, it was really before most congressional campaigns were spending a lot of money on on any of their media platforms. Um, but I think what you saw is because people were spending so much time at home, and I think Edith is absolutely right in terms of like, you know, the, we all tried to be up first and try to own the airwaves um, as long as we possibly could. So I think you know, you saw people go up on TV and go up on digital earlier um, than they have in the past. And, um, you know, I think you saw, and, and this is something that's going to continue into this cycle, like you saw OTT and connected TV become just a, a bigger piece of the pie because people were on Hulu and on, you know, the like Paramount and the other platforms like way more often as they're sitting around yeah. at home watching TV. Um, and like, you know, there, there weren't a lot of new, new um, shows coming out on, on broadcast. Um, but the other thing that I thought was interesting that changed, and this is maybe a more less in like the super early days of the pandemic and more as like voters started to engage with, with these campaigns is um, how campaigns had to adapt their like GOTV strategies to, to change the fact that like voters were going to the polls earlier than they ever have and they were voting in new ways than, than they've ever voted before. Um, so, you know, you, you saw GOTV spending shift earlier to account for the fact that people were voting by mail. Um, and, and there was a, a big education gap because there were lots of states passing new, new rules to, to accommodate the fact that like it wasn't necessarily safe to go to the polls yeah. and, and, and yeah. cast your ballot. So, um, you know, there was a, a big emphasis placed on like educating voters on like, how to vote by mail and then making sure that like people knew that this was something that they could take advantage of. Eric, I want to go back to something you said a couple minutes ago, and, and specifically in, you know, the planning side for a campaign or a cause or whatever, broadcast versus cable and satellite. Um, obviously, we've, you know, I think everybody in this space is moving more towards the audience focus. But how is that, you know, how are you seeing campaigns and causes um, kind of altering their decision mindset when they think about, you know, do we push broadcast or do we go cable? And I just want to kind of keep this, this conversation, let's set digital aside for a moment and just kind of keep this focused on linear. Yeah, so, you know, I think when you're thinking about linear and how you're viewing like those changes, I think it's really thinking about like, we know that a portion of our audience, they're gonna see a lot of our ads and that's important. But in some cases, like we don't need to double down in those areas. So it's thinking about, where your audience is spending their time, whether it's cable versus broadcast, and where we're seeing some of those either lower or higher frequencies and adjusting your plan based on that. And we're utilizing a lot of the data that we have access to um, with some of the smart TV data that is coming out that we haven't had access to prior to help us make those decisions and help us make smarter decisions and then showing clients this is based in data and this is based in, in hard analytics, it makes it a lot easier when they have all the information to make smart decisions. 
Can you talk a little bit more about the the smart TV data? I, know, I think people have touched on it in the past, but what does that what does that look like, and you know how often are you get and stuff like that? Yep. So um, basically, it's with all smart TVs, um, it sits within the TV um, and it recognizes the pixels that are on the screen to allow it to categorize and catalog what ads are being shown. So you know when a TV ad is shown, you know um, all of that information. And so then basically we can tell if our audience is being oversaturated or undersaturated, and then we can build audiences off of that, whether it's over or under, and either build a digital plan around that lower TV frequency audience or vice versa. And so because we have that and we can utilize it directionally because obviously 100% of the market is not a smart TV at this point. Um, we utilize it directionally. It is something that is pretty powerful and is continuing to grow. Um, I know some of the Roku and Samsung are walled gardens, but you can still utilize what you're seeing from LG TVs and Vizio and, and that data to help directionally build out a campaign based on that information. Yeah, and it's kind of a cool. Um, it's a, always a cool thing to to talk a client through, right? Like they're they even if they don't get it, they they know that they should get it or they know that they should like it, right? Because it's it's data driven. So, um, Edith, I'm uh, curious for the you know for some down ballot statewide campaigns. Um, obviously, the budget pressures tend to be you know pretty extreme where you're making you're making decisions of not a media mix between you know, different opportunities. You're saying it's an either or scenario and some of the down ballot stuff that, that RSLC is involved in. How do you see campaigns um, making those decisions wisely? Yeah, and you know, a really good example of that was for us in 2020 um, with North Carolina and the Lieutenant Governor's race. We, you know, we kind of kept getting information back that it was a race that we, really had the opportunity to kind of make or break should we invest. Um, but there was so much going on in North Carolina at the time. And it was such a heavily contested state that, you know, we ended up spending a million dollars. But, you know, prior to that kind of saying, hey, we have a million dollar budget, we're kind of getting laughed at, right? Because what do you do with a million dollars when, you know, your Senate race is spending seven million dollars a week on television? Um, so we were able to work with some really great vendors to kind of, you know, and it took some time, but to kind of sit down and put a plan together that walked us through not just, you know, what does a thousand points look like on TV for your budget, but literally like, this is, you know, these are the times that your ads are running. These are the audiences that are going to be watching it. And we know that this is the audience that we want to be targeted. So this is the times you want to be up. This is how many times your, your commercial is going to air on a radio, excuse me, on television. Um, when we're talking about CTV and OTT, like here are your frequency rates. This is, you know, how much we think percentage wise of your audience is actually going to see this ad more than X number of times. So we were kind of really boiling it down to the granular level because we had to, right? We didn't have the luxury of just saying, hey, put a thousand points on cable or a thousand points on broadcast, you know, and just go for it, saturate the market. You know, we, we couldn't saturate it. So we had to be very precise about what we were watching, when we were watching. And, you know, we're lucky that in today's day and age, you have a lot of that information. Um, but two other things that I, I did want to point out, and this kind of answers a little bit of what we saw in 2020, was we now have the ability to take a video that we would be streaming online and kind of send it directly to a voter, right, via their cell phones. Um, and so that was another way of getting this video that it might be playing the entire time in the background, but maybe our voters muting it every time commercials come on, they're not actually soaking it in. Now they're getting it right in front of their face and it's the exact same video. Um, so that was one thing that we kind of really started utilizing and doubling down on in 2020. And then the kind of last piece that kind of goes with that um, somewhat related was QR codes were just this like new thing that similarly, like now you have cross-platform integration because you're also getting a mail piece that has a QR code that then takes you to the video that you're getting fed, you know, six times a day for two weeks. Um, and it's all this kind of doubling down on the exact same message. So, you know, we just had to be really smart about what we were purchasing it, how we were purchasing it, and then making 
you know, while some, you know, we knew that our Saturday broadcast football buy was going to be probably the most expensive one that we were making, we also knew that our, you know, male audience was more likely than not watching that. So it was worth that investment and kind of pumping it up to the top of our priority list um, and then kind of moving along from there. Pretty cool. Uh, Erica and Michael, uh, she, Edith mentioned the, the QR codes. Are you starting to see more demand for that um, on television and, and on digital screens as well? Are you starting to, to hear campaigns ask about it and try to find creative ways to utilize it? Um, I would say some. Um, there are some campaigns out there. You know, I, I, I haven't seen it really start to take off this cycle, but it's also a little early. Like we're not at the point where we're like designing mail pieces yet um, for the cycle. So, you know, I think, I think certainly it, there's a, a place for it in terms of like how to amplify microsites and, and things like that, that are, that are put out for, for comms purposes um, and, and for educational purposes. So I, I think you'll, I think the place that you'll see it a lot in is like when trying to mobilize voters and, and, and educating them on where their polling locations are and, and things like that. I think that's probably the most common use that you'll see. Less in the persuasion space. And I mean, I think there's a space for both, but I just, I, I haven't seen it quite be there yet. Erica, do you, do you have anything to add on that or you see it differently or same way? No, I, de I definitely agree with uh, what Michael said. Um, you know, we haven't seen a lot of clients, but again, we're still pretty early in the cycle. So that could definitely change. I do think the QR code is having its moment <laughs> um, given everything that people went through in the pandemic and now everybody has to use it, knows how to use it. So I do feel like it's like having its moment in, in the sunshine. Yeah, all of our restaurants finally educated our parents and grandparents on exactly how it works. So thank you for that. All right, I got a, I got a couple more things I wanna make sure we get to before we open this up for, for questions from the group or kick it back to Steve. Um, I'm curious, this is, the, this is probably the most uncomfortable question I'll ask, but I, I'm curious, are campaigns and clients starting to grasp ad fraud and viewability issues and stuff like that? Uh, you know, everybody knows you can get up and leave a TV screen, but it seems like nobody really wants to talk about the, you know, the fraud and viewability issues that happen uh, on some of the smaller screens. Can anybody just offer what kind of conversations clients and campaigns are asking about at this point? So I'll tell you what I'm personally asking um, of a lot of our vendors. It's it's mostly, you know, how are impending um, both federal and local conversations around privacy laws going to affect our ability to target individuals? Um, you know, selfishly, I'm big on the, you know, when I go on a website and ask me for my cookie preferences, I turn them all off because I don't want anyone tracking me, but I recognize that that's a big part of my job. Uh, so I think, you know, again, I, I don't hear too much on the voter side of things, but as a, you know, frequent user of you know, data um, specific to, you know, consumer type stuff. I think that's my concern is, you know, how does this change things or how do we think it'll change things? Erica, has the conversation evolved at all from where it used to be a year or two ago? I do. I think people are, are definitely asking about it more. Um, you know, we're adding it and for some of our clients, just adding it into the report so that they can see that we're below a threshold of acceptable fraud um because there it's like one percent or something like that or i think it's like three percent but it's it's incredibly low and um you know i i think yes it's something we need to be talking about but i i really do think because of moat and ias and all of these other implementation and tracking that we have it because we can see the the bad actors in the space um we're able to call them out and to either not run up with them again or change our plans um so I, I do think it it is something that clients are asking about and talking about and, and wanting to make sure that they're running on non-fraudulent sites yeah yeah absolutely and michael i'm presuming it, with your digital expertise um you're used to having these conversations regularly 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think Erica's spot on. Like campaigns, every cycle we we see campaign managers and campaign staff get more and more educated on these things, um, and and you know it just increases their ability to ask questions and, and be smart about it. And I and I love the fact that you know Erica's and their team are like adding it into the report so that you it's just transparency. I think that's like the big the biggest key here is is just so that people understand what's happening. Yeah, important piece of the puzzle. All right, um, prediction time here, folks. I, I wanna just do this real quick. I'm, I'm curious, I think it'd be a, a fun little exercise. What's the one thing in your opinion that um, is gonna surprise us specifically about linear television this cycle that maybe clients and campaigns aren't thinking about right now or um, you know, the conversation hasn't yet gotten there, but what's the one thing that everybody's going to look back when they, when, you know, we get to November and what are we going to be talking about specific to linear TV? Um, I hate to do this, Erica, I got to pick you first. Um, honestly, I think it's going to be the integration between the two. I think it's truly going to be the integration between TV and digital. Um, I feel like I've been saying this for God knows how many cycles, but I, I believe it's going to happen this one because we have so much data at our fingertips. We can understand who are those low TV viewers. We can understand how to optimize um, from and how to sort of flatten that frequency curve with our linear TV. And so that both mediums can be more powerful together instead of just let's put it all on, on linear and we'll give the remaining budget to digital. I think it's going to be much more of a conversation where both teams are sitting at the table. Yeah. Edith, let's go to you next. What's going to surprise us about linear TV? I'm going to be a little crazy. I think this is going to be the last big year that campaigns spend an insane amount of money on linear. All I right. think after this year, you're going to start to see more money spent in different ways. That's not to say that they're still not going to spend a crazy amount, but I think... Is the the piece of the pie, the piece of the pie is going to shrink. I think so. Okay. Michael prediction. Yeah, I, I agree with both these predictions and I'll just kind of add to it by saying, I think the point ceilings will be lower than they've ever been. Um, I don't think a thousand points is going to mean what it has in the past. And we were, have already seen that between the 2020 cycle and today, just like, like your money will not get you what you what it has in the past on linear TV and be and because of that we'll start to see a lot more diversification in what people are spending their money on. Oh, good thoughts, good thoughts. Well, Steve, why don't we bring you back in here yeah. and uh, if there's questions, but uh, I do want to thank uh, each of the panelists. Appreciate the conversation and the insights. They were great, and we do have some questions. In fact, Rebecca, our presenter from FP1, wants you guys to know, since we're talking about the greater integration of linear and, and digital video, where do you see um, uh, streaming uh, best uh, sitting within the TV buying teams or the digital teams? I, I can jump in there. I think for us, um, it sits with our digital buying team right now because of the fact that we can tag it and we utilize our ad operations team. And so because digital has sort of grown up with ad ops and, and how that works and how that functions, that's where it's sitting for us. Not to say that either team can't know or understand how to do that, but as of right now, I think it's it makes a lot of sense to sit with the digital team. Completely agree. I think the, the way that it's bought is much more like digital than it is like TV and the, the digital staff tend to, to have a better grasp on that, um, even though the creative tends to be more similar than to linear TV. Um, how about, does context matter? I mean, I know that you all talked about the, the difference between big and little screens, but also there is a big difference between YouTube on the big screen, which is sort of a piecemeal experience, a clip, a clip choosing experience, and still a lot more lean in than lean back. Are you measuring at all or thinking uh, and considering at all that kind of, of content context? and the differences among them? And do you see any impact? I can jump. I think it makes a big impact with your creative. If mm -hmm. you're doing YouTube and you only have six seconds, that's a whole lot different than a 30 second TV ad. And so I think in the context of creative, it makes a pretty significant difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. 
Are any of you using ad skipping at all? Or do you just you, you just go for the six seconds and keep it on? We'll do some ad skipping on our end, specifically kind of towards the later months of the year. Mm -hmm. um, and some folks will kind of try to tell you not to because you get, you know, better um, numbers, but I think it's pointless not to not to buy non-skip. Um, how are you, um, are, are any of you using, there are retargeting, uh, email retargeting uh, options from especially a lot of the smart TV platforms. Um, are any of you using those and finding those particularly effective? I ask because that's sort of a brand marketer issue that they've been, those brands that have been using that product offering from the major CTV platforms, they're finding it especially effective. Yeah, that, that's definitely something our, our campaigns have been using, especially that we can identify like who has seen certain ads on on you know both sides of the aisle. I think it's a, it's a really great tool. Yeah. Are you also using how are, how are you guys measuring frequency not just on OTT but frequency across the various screens? Uh, are you able to measure or what are you using to measure saturation levels across all the screens that people are engaging? So. Oh, go ahead. We usually use third party um, vendors to do that. And to kind of like go back to the first question about who's better at buying, what I have found in the last couple of years is I think both your TV and digital vendor have strengths, depending on obviously the buy that you're making, even if it's kind of, you know, TV buying some digital. Um, but I think when you kind of bring in a third party that focuses on the overall like reach across all kind of um, platforms, that's when you get the, you, that's where you ultimately get the best buy. And then they'll work with, whether it's your TV or your digital buyer to then go and produce that actual buy. Mm -hmm. So that, that's been our experience at least. Eric, I'm sorry, Erica, did you wanna jump in on that one? Oh, I was just gonna say, we, we aggregate all the data and then we look across all the platforms. The only one that is kind of sits by itself is Facebook as their walled garden. Well, listen, Rob, gang, thank you so much. This was very illuminating. I really appreciate it. Thanks again.